You're welcome once again to World Congress. And today we are taking up another inspiring topic aimed at building us and strengthening our relationship with God out of the usual tradition. Today's topic is break that engagement. Break that engagement. Hallelujah. And when you hear engagement, your mind quickly rush to engagement as it has to do with relationship with someone. Well, that can also mean that to you. But the issue is break that engagement. Mark chapter 7, verse number 13. And Genesis chapter 27, verse 40. Making the word of God of none effect to your tradition, which you have delivered. In other words, you have taken from generation to generation. And other things like that you have done. And in Genesis 27, 40 says, And it shall come to pass, when thou shalt have dominion, thou shalt break his yoke of your neck. That aspect of the scripture is taken to portray the importance of breaking the yoke. Breaking the yoke. And that yoke could be anything. But in our case this morning, that yoke is the engagement that you are involved in. Hallelujah. Now, the way we define ethnic concept is the way you will understand that concept wherever you find it. For instance, if you define cup to mean shovel, anywhere you see shovel, you call it cup because that is the concept you have built inside of you. So whatever you have seen or whatever you see that particular thing, you quickly think of the definition that you have given. Hallelujah. Your mind is set by the definitions. No wonder they call, they say, they call certain things high definition camera. <laughs> no, your mind is set according to the level of definition you have given to a particular thing. Even some animals you, you are scared of is because of the mindset that you have been given concerning that animal. And even some insects, for example, you see that the, the, the bee and the, the big fly, they look alike in size sometimes. And so if the bee stalk you, the next time you see anything that looks like the bee, even if it is not the bee, you will begin to engage in running away. Hallelujah. You run away because in your mind, you have considered everything that look like the bee to be bee, even though it may not be bee. So the way you define a concept is the way you will always understand that concept wherever you find it. But this becomes more dangerous when your mind has been configured, have been set about spiritual things in a way it is not originally intended, especially from the scriptural point of view. When we begin to give meaning to the things we read from the scriptures, and the meaning you are giving is not the real meaning. I'm going to show us how we do such things and how dangerous it has been. Most of the songs we sing are based on those wrong meaning. Most of the hymns we even sing, sometimes we just sing those hymns for the melody's sake. But some of the weddings do not tally with the essence of the purpose of Christ. But just that the melody is sweet, and so just nod his head for the melody's sake. You see, because those songs we are composed out of ignorance. Most messages are preached out of ignorance. Because we, many are yet to understand the essence of the scriptures, the original essence of the scriptures. And so we give meanings to the things and what meaning you give is the action that you will take as far as that particular concept is concerned. Generally speaking, we are all brought up, you know, with different traditional ways of thinking. There are three major uh, 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 
things that control the way people think. Your tradition has had to do with your, your background, your hometown, your village, your community, your tribe, your race. Your religion, the way your religious system has programmed the way you think about God, about man, about humanity, about the world. And then your political party. Your political party also configures your mind in form, some form of ideology. Maybe you are a Republican, you are a Federalist, you are whatever, zim, 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 they call it in government. You know, and when you are saying, I'm a social Republican, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a, 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 a diplomatic, uh, 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 whatever you call it, all these the political terms. Now, they, conf they, they fashion the way you think, and you say, this is a so, 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 so person's ideology. And those ideology becomes what rules the party and everyone in it. So you see this three major, uh, uh, three-headed monster, what I call the local tradition, I call the religion, and I call political parties. Now, these things help to form how we act, how we be, what we believe, what we say. But if we want to align our mind to what God has said, as, as the scripture is concerned, we must carefully understand the essence of a thing. Like the course we took last Thursday in the beginning. If you don't understand the original intention of something, you will begin to give it a different meaning and your action certainly will go in line with the meaning you give to anything. So when our way of traditional thinking have begin, uh, is beginning to affect the way we live with God, then it is indeed very dangerous. Now, this traditional way of thinking have locked us up in most things. So that even when God is saying something, we don't listen. We listen to those ideologies. They seem to be speaking from within us. Telling us what God should say. So that if God is talking, you say, no, 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 no. God, you are not talking like this. It should be like this. And that has made us not to listen because we have engaged our mind. Or our mind has been engaged to contrary ideas due to the traditional definition of the things that are pertaining to God. So our mind is what? Engaged. That is the engagement now. Our mind is engaged to those contrary ideas and then we begin to give contrary meaning making the word of God of non effect because of our traditional way of thinking if we must begin to have the things of God the way God wants it to be we must re be ready to disengage from those ideologies we must be ready to get ourselves disengaged from those ideologies if not Whatever God is saying will never, never happen in our life. In fact, we will see certain things happening because there are certain things God will do whether you agree or not. So when God is revealing those things to, to, to prepare you for that thing, you are interpreting it in a different way and acting in a different way and God will not bypass you and keep doing what he's doing because you are not listening. You are not listening. Your, your, your mindset is blocking you. That's the story of a man who owed the bank a lot of money and the bank was really on him and so he was worried looking for friends that would loan him money so he can you know clear up the debt he's having with the bank unfortunately everybody he called couldn't help him then his friend that worked in the bank came to him and as friend came he thought the friend came to demand for the money to tell him that there's not no way out so he didn't even allow the man to talk while the man was about to speak, he was like, oh, please, you know you are my friend. I want you to do that. I'm, I'm going to raise him. The man said, you are not listening. He said, no, see, see, look, look, this, what you are doing to me is not good. This, your, your plans are not, in fact, you want to ring me, say, you are not listening. So, okay, 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 say whatever you want to say. After all, I'm doomed already. <laughs> His friend just laughed. He never knew the bank have actually decided to extend the time and even give him extra money to help his business. If he had known, he would have stopped quarreling with his friend the moment the friend called him to discuss with him. And that is what many of us are doing. Our minds have already been engaged to, a, to certain ideologies that we think they are God, godly, especially if they are religious ideologies. They are, they are inclined to our traditional uh, uh, beliefs in our religious movements. Oh, this is how we think about it in this group. This is how we think about it in this group. 
and those things you have taught is to make God to act. So when you are praying, you are praying in line with that ideology and trusting that God will do it because it is your religious system belief. No wonder Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, he said, casting down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Whenever we read this scripture, it says, the weapons of our warfare are not canal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strong ghosts, casting down, blah, 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 blah. And when you read these things, you are, you are looking at your enemies, your problems, your that. This is talking about mental work, imaginations, because those imaginations and uh, uh, thoughts are the things that have shaped your life the way you are. And until they are removed, until they are reset, it will not work. It will not work. I, I had a situation one time, I needed to set an equipment for something. I didn't even know how to set it, but I was having in mind it must be in so so so, so way. And so when I uh, set the uh, instrument the way I think it should be, and it is not going that way, I was not happy. In fact, I, I sweated for some time. Eventually, I forced it to do the way I wanted it to do, and by the time it played out, I never liked the production. I had to go back and say, okay, let me check. Let me follow the instruction just like the equipment have detected. You know, sometimes when you buy certain things, you don't even look at the manual. You just go straight. I know how to do it. I know how to do it. And before you know it, you spoil that equipment. By the time I followed the directives, everything became normal. That is the same thing. Well, our mind is already set. No wonder the book of Proverbs says, it says, be careful how you think, for your thought is shaped. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. So you need to disengage from those kind of thoughts so that you can receive what God is giving. I'm going to give you examples of those thoughts so that I'm not just talk in, in, in an abstract way and disengage and say, okay, uh, and then quickly you, in your mind you think you understand what I'm saying and you start carrying out. You know, sometimes when they have prayer meeting, and the prayer leader is about to give a point. Somebody has started praying already because he thinks he knows what the prayer leader wants to bring out. So don't think you know what I want to say. Just screw down and you hear me well. Hallelujah. Now let's talk about the word engaged. To be engaged is to get joined or hooked up with something or someone. You have hooked up with something or someone. For example, if you have your car, you have to engage your gear to a particular number. For the car to run in that speed, you can say gear one or gear two or gear three. It is the one you have engaged. If you engage gear one and you're pressing the car to go faster than what gear one can allow, it will not go. You might, in fact, you might be destroying your gear gearbox. Whether you are using automatic, whatever, hallelujah, whatever thing you, you, you need to engage the gear before the car will move. And if you engage the car back, I, I see someone who tried to engage his gear and he put reverse and thinking that he has put gear train. He didn't know it was reverse. And then as he fired his car, started going back. The, the gear will not go contrary to where you have put it. Or the movement of the car will not go contrary to where you have engaged it. So to be engaged is like that. It's also like getting hooked up with someone for marriage. Somebody has proposed marriage to you and you have accepted and he said, now you are engaged. Engaged in the sense that you are locked up with that person. No other person can propose marriage to you and you accept. Because you have been engaged to be married to a particular person. And sometimes they use one ring to put you in bondage. And they fix that ring in your hand. And everywhere you are going, I'm engaged. I'm engaged. And any other person coming to propose marriage to you, you will not listen to that person because... Traditionally, it is how it's supposed to be. When you are engaged, you are engaged. Hallelujah. So, whatever you are engaged to, or you are holding completely, takes your attention, takes your focus, takes your energy. It's like you cannot serve two masters. You must focus on one. Your eyes may be two, but they see one thing. If one eye is seeing another thing, and the other eye is seeing another thing, then you have eye problem. Yeah? Begin to have half past four eyes. So your two eyes are two, but they are synchronized. 
they are configured to see one thing at a time. If you must leave one, you must disengage from the other one. Jesus Christ said, he that put his hand on the plow and looked back is not worthy of the kingdom. You cannot be going forward and going backward at the same time. You must choose one. And if the one you are choosing is wrong, you must disengage from that one to get to the other one. There's a story of a young lady who was engaged by a young man. You know, they were engaged. And she was so excited about the engagement that she carries her ring anywhere she's going, her office, marketplace, anybody who sees her and tries to talk to her about relationship, she'll say, I am engaged. Can't you see? I am engaged. She continued that word until the young man she was engaged to had to travel abroad, you know, to see how to make things happen, to better the life. So when he comes back, they can get married. And then he traveled. And this lady kept going to the family house of the young man, helping the parents, sweeping the house, cooking food, even supporting them with her own personal money, doing all sorts of things. One year, two years, three years. You know, until the young man couldn't even write letter anymore. And then she was still hoping. All this while, other responsible and reasonable people came to propose marriage to her. She was simply them, I am engaged. Some, some, some she will slap them. So she will insult them. I am engaged. I am engaged. Leave me alone. I am engaged. She was waiting three years, four years, five years, six years, seven years, eight years. She was still strong and hoping that this particular young man is coming back for her. She was also growing older. You know, as you are waiting, you are getting old. Gray hairs are coming out. <laughs> but since she thought she was engaged, she stayed there. Eventually, a young man came back from overseas, and to her greatest surprise, to cut the long story short, the young man was already married with children. <laughs> Within that eight years, he had, he had gotten married, he had children, and he came back with his wife and children and told the young lady, I am very sorry. You should have known better to, after you have waited for me for some time, you would have just left and do your thing, because uh, you know, I don't know how to tell you this. That was devastating. That is how many people will see it on the last day. Because you have been so much engaged in certain things that are not of God. You think they are of God. Paul said when he was slaughtering and arresting and beating up the Christians of those days, he said he thought he was working and fighting for God. And Jesus Christ himself, talking to his disciples, even mentioned that says, when they kill you, they will think they are doing God's service. And it happened many years back. When even the Christians, we are killing fellow Christians because of doctrines, because of dogmas. There are certain things we say today, if it were said in those days, the church itself will come and arrest you and kill you. They say, it's either you recant and accept what we have said in our council. And people say, no, people like John Hose, who translated the scriptures, they, they, he, he was burnt alive. And all the Bibles he translated were packed and burnt up. All those things we have to defend. I'm talking about other religious systems that attack other religious groups. Their ideology supports them killing and maiming. And when they do those things, they believe that they are doing it in the name of God. That's why Jesus Christ will say in his father, he says, On the last day, many shall come in my name and say, We did this in your name. We did that in your name. We did the other one in your name. And he said, Depart from me. Ye cast into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and the angels. You were cast of iniquity because you misinterpreted the word. Paul said they twisted the scriptures for their own destruction. So this ungodly engagement is one of the reasons why most times we seem not to understand how and why certain things happen. But instead of seeking God normally and ordinarily, we wave it off with one scripture. So it is well. Oh, God is in control. <laughs> is God really in control? But he said, I am not in control, my friend. Come, let me tell you what to uh, The Bible says, he that read the scriptures of the Lord. The Bible says, the Bible says, you put, 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 and use it to wave out the thing, and the thing still happened. And you're wondering, ah, but I did this, I quoted scriptures, I confessed, I did that one. Why? Because your mind is engaged to traditions of men instead of the wisdom of God. No wonder God said, Come, let us reason together. This is 
confuse our mind and make us to feel that relationship with God is a very difficult thing. In fact, most of the songs we sing make it look like that. It's not an easy road. We are traveling to heaven. Even at that one class and that story. It's not an easy road. So as soon as you are becoming born again, somebody goes to crusade, he had the gospel, so to say, and gives his life to Christ. They invite him to church. They say, you are welcome. Now you are born again. The person is just born again, fresh. The mind open. You welcome him to the church and then you start your so-called discipleship program. And what you do, instead of discipling the person to be like Christ, you begin to disciple him according to the traditions of your religion. And by the time you are through, the person is conf more confused than he was before he became a Christian. He's more, more devastated, more traumatized. The question is, what have you programmed his mind to? Just like you give birth to a newborn baby. The baby is very young, he has no problem, he has no enemies, he has no... It's just anybody that comes with the hand, he will, which will the child will... Then as the child is growing up, you begin to teach the child. One, you teach the child your language. Two, as you start cursing, you idiot, God punish you, the child is learning. Then you begin to teach the child those who are your enemies and those who are your friends. Those who to talk to and those who not to talk to. The child is learning. Hey, don't go to that compound, don't go to that family, the child is learning. And by the time you know it, the child has grown to imbibe all those things. The child goes to school, they teach him about his country. This country is bad, this country is good, our own country is better. And the child is imbibing those things. Oh, this religion is this, the other one is that. The child is imbibing those things. Oh, this system of politics is like this. This social president is like that. The child is imbibing. And before you know it, the child has begun to form his own belief based on the background you have given to it. Now, if you have given the child good background, he will go through that way. No wonder the scripture says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's grown, he will not depart from it. Whether good or bad, the way you train the child is the way he will go. So, if we don't cut off those ideas, we will grow to develop a form of spirituality that seems to be godly, but is godless. But we say, having the form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I'm going to give some examples that we will use because it's a very broad thing to talk about and we cannot finish it in just one sitting. Now, let me give you an example. For example, when we hear some words that we commonly use uh, in, in, among the believers, among the church, what meaning do you give to it? Prayer. When you hear, we are going to have prayer. What comes to your mind? You, what comes to your mind is what you have seen people do and call it prayer. And that is what we are brought up to believe. And to you, prayer is in Jesus' name. Father, 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 Father. And then, you know, prayer, you have to close your eyes and put your two hands together. And that is what you call prayer. I'm not disputing with your traditional definition of prayer. But those traditional definitions have engaged you into a pattern that even when you are supposed to be praying, you think you are praying, but you are not praying. Hallelujah. For example, the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Men ought to pray without fainting. And if prayer is locking yourself in your room and closing your, you know, locking up everywhere and then praying and praying, talking, 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 talking for the next one hour. Say, oh, today I pray, cry. You, because of your definition of prayer and what you grew up to see people call prayer to you, that is prayer. And putting two hands together becomes a symbol of what? Prayer in your own tradition. While in some other tradition, putting hands together may mean another thing. You see? Now, if that is prayer, how can you pray always? How can you pray 24 hours? You say, oh, I, I can you pray at least three hours in a day. If you are praying three hours in a day, you are not even praying because prayer should be what? 24 hours. Continuous. And if it's like that, then there must be another definition that you have not known that prayer is. Until you discover that definition, you will keep doing what you think is prayer. Oh, if I want to pray, I have to be in a place that is very quiet, everywhere is quiet. Do you know that you can be in a very quiet environment? Everywhere is quiet and nice, but within your mind, your mind is not quiet. You are still not in a quiet environment. Also, you can be in a noisy environment, but your mind is very quiet. You are in a quiet environment. So, a quietness now does not necessarily mean external quietness. 
but the synchronization of your mind and the spirit, where your spirit now is able to communicate with your mind, translate what you have in your heart to the spirit of God. You say your spirit pray yet while your understanding does not connect. In other words, you may not know that prayer is going on, but you are praying. And so there's no talk about speaking in tongues or praying in tongues because you are born and what we hear about tongues is when we speak, you know, like that, that, you know, certain things that you don't understand. You forget that that word tongue simply means language. That word praying in tongue is an, it's King James translation. It simply means praying in other languages. It may be a language that is known. It may be a language that is unknown. So when you are praying in that language, you are actually using every language half syllables. That's the way it goes. It's not just uh, uh, gabberish, ordinary gabberish things you just say. Some people are now even using it, uh, using those gabberish things to greet. They see on the door, all kinds of useless things are happening today because you think that is what you call tongues. Have you ever asked the Holy Spirit what is tongues or allow Him to speak? I remember when I attended the program for the first time, you know, before that time, religious organization I belong to do not believe in speaking in tongues in, in other languages as it was spoken among the Pentecostals and Charismatics. And then they say, if you have not been speaking in tongues, please come forward. We're going to lead you in prayers to do that. And I came forward and other people came forward. They say, now you have to open your mouth, begin to say, talk like this, talk like that, talk like that, turn the two with. I said to myself, if this thing is true, I want the real one. I will not talk anything. If Holy Spirit is the one that gives tongues, let him come and open my mouth by his, by his own hand and speak. Me, I'm not going to open my mouth and say anything. Others were busy, you know, trying to repeat what the man said they should repeat. They repeat, 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 repeat. And then they began to sound something somehow and they say, oh, they have spoken in tongues. But I refuse to do that. I stood there and said, if I will speak any tongue, the tongue will come by itself. I will not force myself to speak. Bible says, as the Lord give them utterance. It was in that state, even when others have been speaking, whatever they are speaking for a long time, suddenly my own mouth started saying certain things, but in a different, different syllable, not just like the other words I, I was hearing. I'm not saying those words are not correct, but I'm saying that if we have defined certain things, it may limit the way God will want to manifest through us. You must disengage from the things you think are the right way and ask the Lord to help you. Another word is fasting. When you hear fasting, what do you think? We use the definition of words as given in the English dictionary to give it a, 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 a meaning. Especially spiritual words. If it's ordinary words, yes, but when it comes to things that have to do with the spirit, it is not always the ordinary English translation so, or English interpretation that you give to it. You need the Holy Spirit to give you an understanding. And that starts when you begin to read that particular scripture in context. As we to read it in context, the meaning of that word will come, which may be contrary to the definition you see in the English learned dictionary. Yes, there are words you can interpret dictionary that are not spiritual things, things that, that, that does not have to do with your spiritual uh, 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 oppressions. You can define, but when it comes to things like prayer, fasting, meditation, seeking the Lord, keeping your eyes on Jesus, you must understand what it is saying in context. And then allow the Holy Spirit to give you the meaning. And that meaning will help you. Because if your mind is already engaged, you will have problem. You'll be doing certain things thinking that I have done what God says I should, I should do. But you are simply doing what you are, your tradition says you should do. You must disengage now. Hallelujah. Now, this problem has been there. The problem of misinterpreting what God is saying has been there because of our mental states. It even happened to Moses. For example, you know, Moses will always have introduced a lot of things among the Israelites, you know, sacrifice, burning of incense, fasting, avoiding certain things, some meat are clean, some meat are unclean, don't do like this. They forget that God was giving Moses all these things as a symbolism of what is to come. They are shadows of what is to come. Moses didn't understand that. And so he made them more as laws. And people are busy 
offering sacrifices, busy killing, burning incense in their temples. They say, oh God say we should burn incense. God say we kill animal, pour the blood here, do this one. These are instructional material trying to teach them what Christ will do in the future. Because the scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, is all about Christ and the work of redemption. Anything that is not in line with work of redemption is not of God. Don't be going to the Bible to find how to dress, how to do this, how to do that. You must understand that God's interest is something of your soul. The Spirit of God in you will guide you into all the truth that you need to know. But we, we are looking for rules and regulations and we misinterpret it. Why did I say that Moses misinterpreted? Take your time and open your Bible to the book of Isaiah chapter 1, 11 to 15. And you see where God is telling the people who asks you to do all these things. I'm not interested in your Sabbath. I'm not interested in your new moon. I'm not interested in your sacrifices. I'm not interested in the blood of animals and fat you are bringing to me. Who even asks you to do all this? Now, if, it, if God, what they were doing was what God wanted, will God be angry that they are doing such things? They left the real thing God wanted to do as I doing another thing. Isaiah chapter 1, 11 to 15. Take them and read it. Read it all. And again, oh, they said to God, we have fasted, and you didn't listen to us. We have fasted, and God, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, 3 to 14, God was talking to them, he said, what do you call fasting? A day to humble yourself, not to eat food, and become wearing tattered cloth, and looking miserable, is that what you call fasting? If you go down, he says, this is what I want you to do. This is what I call fasting. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? Now, some people would misinterpret it and say, God says he has chosen fasting to break the bond of, uh, of, of this, to do that, to do that. If you miss it, you have missed it. And people will be miserable. When they finish it, they wonder why nothing is happening in line with what they so-called uh, supposedly have prayed. Usually, those prayers are fleshy and lustly prayers that have nothing to do with God's word and God's purpose for mankind and even yourself as a person. Because you're not praying by the Spirit. Yes, you're not praying by the Spirit. Even when people say, okay, if I pray in English, Satan will hear it, let me pray in tongues. There's nowhere in the scripture they say, praying in tongues is to avoid Satan from hearing you. Is Satan an Englishman? Or a or, 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 or tree or whatever tradition you belong to? So if you are not concerned, speak, we speak in tongues, Satan is confused. Who told you Satan is confused? <laughs> it is the state of your mind that determines who you connect to in prayer. So even when you are speaking in tongues, what is the state of your mind? What is the state of your mind? He said the heart felt prayer, not the mouth felt prayer. So if you misinterpret something, you may be doing things. It looks normal. If another person sees, oh, this person is praying. Oh, now that man knows how to blast in tongues. They call it blast. Do you blast in English? Do you blast in your village language? Do you call it blasting? It don't blast. Tongues is not machine gun. People say, oh, when I release my machine gun, blah, 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 blah. that's not tongues. You are just doing nonsense. Tongues is not machine gun. Tongues is not printing press. It is language. It is talking. It is communication. So just stop all this drama that people have put into speaking in tongues and made it to look like nonsense. And when you open your mouth and tongue doesn't come, pray in the language you understand. Until the tongue comes. If it comes, if that language comes, you speak. Don't force yourself and manufacture something. If it doesn't come, speak the one you know. What matters is the state of your heart. He said the prayer, the heart, the prayer made in faith. The prayer of a righteous man or the heartfelt prayer make a tremendous power available. Mighty in his working. You wonder why it has no mighty you are doing. Uh, 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 40 days prayer and fasting, we are, uh, solemn, solemn assembly. Christians will gather, and thousands of Christians will gather, they will kneel down, and they will be fasting and pray and doing what they think is fasting and what they think is prayer, and yet nothing is happening, and they are wondering why. They say, oh, maybe we have not fasted enough, maybe we have not, let us do this, let us sow this, let us sacrifice this, trying to do like the children of Baal. You know, when they went there to call their God, they had to cut their body, they had to do a lot of things. Where did you learn all these things? Where did we learn all these things? I'm not exonerating myself. We, we are all in it. Where did we learn all Who taught us all these things? We must disengage and allow the Holy Spirit to be engaged to us. Now, do you also know that the teachings of Jesus Christ in the Bible 
are not for anything but for the kingdom of God. When Jesus Christ talk about prayer, talk about fasting, talk about uh, this kind going that away, talk about marriage, talk about anything he said about are all symbolism of the kingdom of God. He never preached any other thing. Matthew chapter 4 verse 23 said, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogue and preaching. Preaching what? The gospel or good news of the kingdom of God. And then they were stretching the power of that good news through healing all manner of sicknesses and all manner of diseases among the people. So when he talked about marriage, he's teaching about the, the unity between us and God. And Paul said it is the mystery is between Christ and the church. When he talked about, about uh, a king who traveled and wanted to be a king, and then he went and came back, and when he came back, you know, some people didn't want to make him king. And when he was made king and he came back, he said, gather all those who don't want to make me king and let us slaughter them. And some Christians have used it as a prayer point. I'm going to pray today. Everybody who doesn't want us to become what we want to be, we're going to gather them here in the spirit and slaughter them. Slaughter! And, and some of them even use koboko. Use, uh, what do you call it now? Machet. I begin to do. Slaughter them. Slaughter them. Some buy coconuts. And put the two coconuts together and break it. They are broken the head of their enemies. Yes. Jesus Christ said, gather them together and kill them. If Jesus Christ said, kill them, are you better than Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ never said, kill anybody. He was giving you an example of what will happen at the coming of the Lord. All those who did not accept Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior will continue in eternal death, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that believe not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's all he's showing. The story of the five foolish virgins and the five wise virgins is also about the kingdom of God. The story of talents is not about business. Yes, you may learn some business principles from it, but that is not what he's trying to say. But that thing he's trying to say is purely about the kingdom. Jesus Christ never taught you how to manage money or how to do marriage or how to eat food or how to uh, uh, do this or that. No, 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 no. Yes, you can learn a few things from those things. You can learn anything from anything. But try to understand that his message is the gospel of the kingdom. And when he sent his disciples to go, I told them, go into the world and preach the gospel. Every other thing you are preaching, if you are not given divine guidance by the Holy Spirit, you are just quoting scriptures and mis twisting it to create atmosphere of frustration and disaster among people. We must begin to repent of all these things. Like I said, I'm not exhorting myself. We have to go back to the truth of the word of God. We, as Christians all over the world, and when I say Christians, I define Christian on Thursday. If you don't know it, just go back to the, to the video on that and watch. Hallelujah. Christian is not somebody who goes to church or somebody who has converted to the Christian religion. That may be Christian for the worldly aspect, but we are talking about Becoming united with the Spirit of Christ. That's why the Spirit of Christ is in you. So Jesus never taught you how to do business. Or taught you how to marry. Or how to divorce. Or how to pray. He said, when you pray, do like that. That prayer he's teaching. Okay, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Do you know what it means? Is he teaching you actually on that? Now, the, the apostles break down all the teachings that Jesus Christ gave. And brought out the deep meanings. Unfortunately, we don't have all the documents of these things, but there are documents that also prove those things. Even the books of the epistles, the letters, Paul, Peter, when they explain things, they are trying to break down to help you understand those parables that Jesus Christ was given when he was on earth. He gave more of parable. The only thing that is so clear is the gospel of the kingdom of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. God has not sent his son to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. For he has not believed. That's just all. And then he said again, For God so loved the world, that he gave his holy begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have a blessed life. For God was in Christ, reconciling men to himself. Why, why all that? These are the center and the core of whatever Jesus Christ ever taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That people call the gospel. So it's not just a biographical story. Just read it with the understanding of the message of Christ and then you will get it. 
Now, do you know that sometimes we use Greek word and Hebrew word to interpret scripture? Sometimes it is not correct. Because when you, you go to Greek dictionary and get the Greek meaning of that word, it may not be what the person who used that word in the scripture is saying. Let me give you an example. Let's say you go to the book of Luke, chapter 14, verse 23. That talks about a, a man who invited people for his uh, party ceremony. He told them, oh, I've prepared. Some say, oh, I, ha I have bought, bought a cow. I want to go and check how it works. I've just got married. I want to go and uh, 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 stay with my wife. I bought a land, blah, blah, blah. And all of them had excuses. They never came for the wedding. For the party he, he set up. So he sent his brother and uh, his men, his servants. So go to the highway. Go and compel people to come. The word compel is taken from the word anakazo. Anakazo. We look so much like forcing someone. That is the meaning of the word anakazo. Compel. Constrain. Force. And now, if you use the Greek definition of anakazo, which is force, compare, constraint, and put it into that scripture, you may begin to interpret it to mean going out of the road and you feel that church service is the party of Jesus. Your church hall is the house, he said, that my house may be full. And then you go out there and anybody see on the street, you will drag him into the church hall. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm following what the scripture said. Anakazo means pull, drag, force. But if you put it in context, do you think you go out there and see somebody going somewhere and you drag him into the church, into your church hall and say, sit down? So, if you are to interpret an akazo in that scripture, you will talk about it mainly on persuading. You persuade. You encourage. You try to talk to the person and make him understand why he should attend whatever you are calling him to attend. You don't force him. You don't threaten him. You see? So, most people have taken that in, out of context and are using it to, as a means of evangelism. They say, oh, that is evangelism. Paul says, having known the terror of God, we, we persuade men. We do what? We persuade. We don't force. We don't try to use rope to tie you. We don't say, if you don't, you will die. If you don't, you will do this. If you threaten anyone, then the person accepts. The person has not accepted with his heart. If you don't accept Jesus Christ, hmm, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, uh, uh, you will go to hellfire. Nice. But the person might be scared of fire to accept Jesus Christ. Did he accept Jesus Christ truly? He's so scared. But help him to understand what Christ has done for him through his death and resurrection. When he understands it, the Holy Spirit will take over from there and the person will be saved. Not by your own power and your own force. Now, when Peter was busy telling long stories of, of, about Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God entered Colonus and his family, and they were saved. Peter said, wow, they're already saved, so what will stop us from baptizing these ones? Let's go and baptize them. They already, I, I stopped my message. If you don't disengage from those wrong meanings, what did God define fasting to mean in Isaiah chapter 58, 3 to 14? What does it mean? Go there and read. What does God mean by Sabbath? What does God mean by sacrifices, incense, and all that? What does it mean? Go to Isaiah chapter 1, 11 to 15. And read. And go to the book of Revelation. And read about the incense. Say incense are symbolism of what? Prayers. No, God is not asking them to go and mix some, some chemicals and be burning it and be doing shaka, 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 shaka. He say you are burning incense. You are attracting, you are attracting demons. Most of these things we do, out of the original intention of the scriptures, you are opening the door for demonic oppression. That is why the more we are doing church things, the more we are doing religious things, the more evil is getting worse and worse and worse. Can't we just sit there and ask ourselves a question? Are we really doing the right thing? Is it just because uh, John, uh, John so, so so person did it in 1425? To tell you I did it in 1322. John Wesley did it in 2021. Uh, uh, in, 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 in 1221. So, 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 this is our, our tradition. Now, you start prayers by this and by that. May the Lord help us. 
One of the days I wanted to pray some years back and I wanted to do the form normal thing. Say, sit down and talk to me like you talk to anybody. So I just took my chair, I sat down. I didn't kneel down, I didn't fold my hand. I sat down, I was studying, and then something came to my mind. I started talking to God as if God is sitting at the, the front, my, my, my front. I said, What is this? Why this? Why that? To my greatest surprise, I was seeing it was like a chat. And when he said, Go here right now, I didn't say, I'm still praying. I got up from there, I went to where I, while I was going, I was still chatting. So it is, it is a spiritual communication, it is not a physical thing. My mouth may not be saying anything, but I'm praying. In fact, if I'm talking to you right now, I am praying. I may not even know what I'm praying, but I'm praying. Why? My spirit is praying. My spirit is committed because I've set my heart to commune. And that's why certain things I might experience in my life may not be what I prayed for openly with my mouth. But I said, wow, I never prayed for this. You prayed. You actually prayed without knowing, especially if you're a child of God. And if you're not a child of God, another child of God is praying for you. That's why you saw those things. Then me, I'm praying. It's why your brother, your sister, your cousin, your friend, somebody have lost contact with the Holy Spirit can touch him. Pray for so 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 person. And when the person begins to think about you in his mind, his spirit begins to commune with God concerning you. And you see those things. You say, Ah, it is the, it is the thing I did that brought it. And you begin to ask yourself, Oh, uh, why did they say I should not do like this? this? What I'm doing is what is helping me. Who told you? That is why when you have done it again, why is it not helping you again? You must disengage from all those things if you want the Lord to flow. Your church building is not that house. Anakazo is not about forcing people. Anakazo in Greek may mean force, but in context of what is being said, it is persuasion. It is convincing. It takes you out. When you go out of the original intention of what God is saying in the scriptures, it takes you out of what is intended. And before you know it, you are doing certain things that does not align with the plan of God. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 21 to 23, you see a story of Isaac. The Bible says, Isaac's wife was not giving birth, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was buried. And the Lord was entreated of him. And when he heard that word, entreated, oh, you mean, maybe Isaac had to go to the mountain, embark on this, embark on that. Have you ever thought that it was all divine arrangement? And Isaac discussed with God, and God discussed back with Isaac. How, was, how did Abraham pray in his days? Was it the way we are praying right now? So when, when you see something happen, don't use the way you are doing things today to give the meaning. It can destroy the meaning of what the scripture is saying. The other one says, And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And she began to struggle within her. And she said, If I am okay, why am I like this? And so she inquired of the Lord. And when you hear inquired of the Lord, you think that she have consulted the prophet. I want to go and meet one prophet. They said, well, one strong man of God. I said, let me go and consult him. And ask him what is happening in my life. And the person will now tell you, Jargons and destroy your entire life and family. And you come back and begin to implement those things. Why is it that the things that the so called prophet told you you are implementing is not bringing peace and unity and love in your family? It's bringing out that destruction, hatred, and fight. Why? He said, My peace have I given to you. Shalom. That's what God gives. If God's word comes, it brings peace. Bible says He will speak peace to your soul. But when the, the so-called prophet is really talking, it is disaster. You even carry a knife and go and kill somebody because you think the person is your enemy. Why not you mean that Rebecca discussed with God and God discussed with her out of the kind of mindset, religious mindset that have been produced by all forms of things out there. Prophet, that word prophet is very uh, wonderful. But it is one of the dooms of our society. Why do I say so? A prophet is one who brings the word of God to edify, to encourage, to strengthen faith. Now, if the prophet does not have the word of God, he is just an empty vessel, talking nothing. The Bible says, by a prophet, God brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet, he what? Settled them. 
And today they'll tell you, oh, you need a prophet to come out of your captivity. And you need a prophet to be settled. You need us, the prophets, to bring you out. And you need us, the prophet. Not lie. That's not what the scripture is saying. Can you just understand something? A prophet brings the word of God. So what makes a prophet authentic is the word of God, not his own words. Not speaking from his own mindset. So you can put it this way. By the word of God, Israel was brought out of captivity. And by the word of God, Israel was settled. So it's not about the instrument that brought the word. It's about the word. And the entrance of the word gave it light and what understanding. He sent forth his word and his word he led them. The word can come through anybody. And the person at that moment is prophet. Anybody that is bringing you the word of God in line with God's purpose is a prophet at that time. When he starts bringing his own thought, he's no longer a prophet. He is one man. So he does say, let me go and consult one prophet somewhere. He said, that, that, that man cry. Why is the Holy Spirit in you? You want to go and do something. And if you do your consultation, it doesn't work the way it wants. They tell you, bring this, bring that, bring such an amount of money, bring this one, bring this one, bring this one by 12 midnight, bring this one by every three, three hours, pour this one here. Do this one like this, and you begin to do all those things, do all those things, do all those things. You are seeing yourself doing like Juju Priest without knowing. You are trying to what? Make the gods speak. Not God, though, gods. If you guys don't know, most people who are called prophets today are sorcerers. There are prophets. A true prophet is the one who brings you the good news, who brings you the word of God. It's called the message of reconciliation. Not the message of destruction. Hallelujah. Oh, after all, Elijah called down fire from heaven. Yes, Elijah did that. God of Elijah sent down fire. He wanted him to send down fire and consume. That is wonderful. But let's see how Jesus Christ saw it. The disciples were passing through Samaria. And the people of Samaria refused to allow them. And James and John were so angry. And they said, Jesus, give us, allow, allow us. To release fire from heaven. To burn down the Samaritans. Just like Elijah did. And Jesus looked at them. And said you don't know the kind of spirit you have. For the son of man have not come to destroy lives. But to save lives. He did not come to judge the world. He did not come to blame. He did not only come to seek. It was to save he came. And when we call him Savior, and when we call him Savior, and when we call him Savior, then we call him by his name. He's called Christ. He's called Jesus. Both of them means what? Anointed one that saves people. Simple. Oh, Peter destroyed Ananias and Sapphira. How did he? Did you ever hear from the mouth of Peter that he asked Ananias and Sapphira to die? God knows how to handle his matters. Did Peter, did the church pray that Herod should die when he was, when he was, uh, he kept Peter in prison? No. They were praying for God to deliver them from wicked and unreasonable men. God delivered Peter from wicked and unreasonable Herod. And God delivered Peter. What happened to Herod? It was in the hand of God. An angel of the Lord struck him in another occasion and he died. So it was not God who, who, uh, uh, Peter and uh, the church that prayed against Herod. Oh, the Herod will die. Every Herod we kill him now in Jesus' name. No, 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 no. Don't. Jesus will not answer you. Demons will answer you. All your prayer is God deliver us from wicked and unreasonable people. And allow God to do whatever he wants to do. I don't try to figure out what God will do. I'm going to use your mind to calculate what he will do. No. God is not your messenger. You are supposed to be his messenger. All kinds of false theology that have been manipulated and brought into the church system today is very horrible. And in the time of our ignorance, we all flew with those nonsense. Bible says, in the days of your ignorance, God overlooked, but now he calls you to repent. Break that engagement now. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul said again, cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. This is the way to go. How do you cast down imaginations and uh, bring down every high thing? Is it through 
Change. Boom. I cast down. Every imagination. I cast it down. No, no, it's not talking. To cast down an imagination is to ask yourself, how did I start imagining that thing in the first place? Now you are imagining yourself thinking in a certain way. Now you know the right way to think. Just shift your mind. Just shift your mind to the right thing and meditate on that new thing. And your mind will change. You don't change your mind by laying hand on your head and commanding your mind to change. Your mind does not change by commanding because it was not command I meant to do. Somebody said, command my cigarette smoking to stop. How did you start smoking? You started following those who smoke. You started feeling that thinking that smoking makes you high. Why not start changing your thinking? I remember when I was uh, in charge of health services in one, in one school. And then I was trying to teach the children, not even biblically, on how to avoid uh, smoking, alcohol, and lots of them. We have to bring out alternatives. Alternative things that may seemingly give you the same effect that those destructive substances are giving. And before you know it, your body begins to reject those things and begin to accept the new thing. And the new thing is normal thing. Tea. Normal tea you drink. Normal bread you chew. Normal food you eat. And before you know it, you are now nourishing your body instead of destroying your body. So, casting that imagination does not mean I cast you out in the name of Jesus. No. When you are casting out a demon, that is not what you do. Something that are probably you are not necessarily demons. They are the things you have used yourself to create for yourself. So, what do you do? You have to what? Reconcile and remove. Repent. Re, re means going back from it. If you, are, if you are looking at pornography, you're always watching pornography. Your mind now is pornography. When you dream, you see yourself sleeping with one man or sleeping with one woman. What do you do? Take the way you think. It is your thinking that is making you do those things. If you like, go for deliverance, for prayer, they drink coconut, drink oil, drink nothing will happen. It was you who started watching those things. Stop watching them and start watching right things. Focus your mind. Gradually, gradually, your mind is like a tape recorder. It will clean up those old things and the new things will come to be recorded there. Somebody gave me a tape recorder some time ago that contains worldly music. When I put it in my tape, it was playing worldly music. Oi. What I did was so I rolled it back, put it in my tape, and took it to a crusade. And whenever I go to any crusade, I'll take any of those steps and I'll play, press play, uh, record. The man will be, one of God will be preaching, it will be cleaning the old things and putting in the new ones. So eventually, all those steps started playing. Playing God's uh, messages and messages and messages and messages. The same thing. Your mind is like that. So don't be praying like I cast it, I lose it, I destroy. Whatever you bind on earth is binding in heaven. So I cast and bind. That's why you are binded and casted. Nothing is casting because you are following the wrong format. In fact, even that binding and casting, go and look at it very well. What does it mean? It means prohibiting and allowing. When you look at English uh, 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 King James translation, sometimes. The, the, the meaning you get from there does not utterly. That's why you have to use several translations. It is simply whatever you permit on earth is permitted in heaven. And whatever you disallow on earth is allowed in heaven. In fact, another translation has it this way. It says, whatever you are permitting on earth should be what is permitted in heaven. And whatever you are uh, uh, disallowing on earth should be what is disallowed in heaven. And how do you know what heaven disallowed or what, what heaven permits? It is through the Holy Spirit. That's why 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 to 27. 20 and 27, actually. He said, But you have received an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. But the anointing which you have received abided in you, and you don't need anyone to teach you, but the anointing teaches you all things, and that, is, that teaching is true. It is not lie. Even as he has taught you, abide in him. You have received anointing. You have received the Holy Spirit. Let him teach you. Now you say, oh, the Bible says, let nobody teach us. So why are you teaching us? I am not teaching you anything. I am only what, echoing what the Holy Spirit is teaching you. So what he's saying here, that it means that if I'm to preach or to teach, I should not teach my own thing. I should help you understand what the Spirit is saying to the church. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So I will only come in to help you understand what the Spirit is saying. I am not going to teach you my own thing. That's why Paul says, uh, the, the preaching I brought to you is not of my own human wisdom, but of the power of God. What is the power of God? The gospel. So that your faith will not be rested on human wisdom. Most of our faith are rested on human wisdom. That's why when you have done all those humanistic things, you are dead. You are finished. 
I don't want to bring up points and issues that are trending in the church system today that many great men of God project and teach. They sound nice, but they are completely error. Error. And we grew up with all those things. But by the time you remove that goggle from your eyes, by the time you disengage and go back to the scripture, you'll be seeing things clearly. You will know that it is an easy road. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know that voice of the cross, they tried in their own time, but they sang based on what they know. It's not an easy road. We are traveling. We are traveling. Now, yes, we are traveling, but you have to understand what kind of travel it is. I don't have time, maybe what in, in subsequent uh, uh, World Congress will talk about the traveling. Why we're a pilgrim. Maybe probably will teach about the pilgrim, the Christian pilgrim. And you understand that a Christian pilgrim is not necessarily somebody who is traveling from one place to another, always traveling from earth to heaven. You understand what it means? May the Lord open your eyes and give you understanding. James chapter 1 verse 21 says, Therefore, rid yourself of all moral faith and evil. Humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save you. I will end here this morning. Disengage. Break that engagement with that wrong dogma. Break that engagement with that wrong association. And let me tell you, for those of you who thought my teaching this morning was on breaking marriage relationship, I'm going to tell you now. Look at my face very well. Break that engagement from that man and that woman that is leading you astray. Since you got engaged to that young man, how is your life? You are now beginning to do all sorts of rubbish. Your, your bread doesn't go straight anymore. Your business is going down because you don't even have time to think. Some relationship you are in must be broken. Break it before it becomes marriage because divorce is more terrible than breaking courtship or engagement. A broken engagement is better than a broken marriage. So to avoid trouble in your marriage tomorrow, break that in. Somebody has impregnated you. And because you are ashamed that people will determine that you are pregnant, you marry the person. When you know that that person is not the right person for you, you have already sown yourself into disaster. And you begin to buy, want the whole church to be praying and casting demon for you. You know what you are doing. When you are doing it, nobody's problem. But when it happens tomorrow, all of us begin to talk. Break that engagement right now. Yes, my teaching today is purely on ideological engagement. But this time around, I'm talking to those of you who are engaged to marry somebody who is leading you astray. You are a fervent child of God. Now you are down. Since you got engaged, break that engagement. Hey, hey, he loves me. He doesn't love you. That love you're talking about is the money he gives to you. He gives me money. He buys me, meets my need. He buys me, he buys me that. One day you leave those things important for you. Haven't you seen people who just finished wedding that same day? They died in accident. How, how did they enjoy the things? So don't allow the things of this whole materialistic thing to be the thing that will guide you in accepting proposal. Oh, he took me to a party. He nailed down. And the way he even nailed down, eh? Are you foolish? Are you stupid? Let me tell you, any problem you will see in your marriage, you have already seen it before you enter. You only tend to be blind. There is no problem you see in marriage that does not start from the beginning. Everything started. That's why if you come to me and say, you have body problem. I ask you, how did this start? How did you begin this relationship? What was happening when you are doing it? That is what is replaying. Just repent and ask God to forgive you. And then begin to reverse your mind. Maybe God will reconstruct your mindset and make you to become blind. So your marriage can work. Every marriage can be repaired. If you are ready to disengage from that useless and stupid ideologies you have used all this while. I pray the Lord give you understanding. Whether it is wrong understanding of God's word. Or wrong relationship. Or wrong friendship with people. Or wrong association you have joined, may the Lord bring you out from those things that try to form your life into disaster. May He bring you out, like Colossians chapter 3 will say, Now that you have risen with Christ, set your heart on things above and not on the things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid in Christ in God. Put to death those things that are of the earth, so that the things that are of God will manifest in your life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask that the understanding be granted to every one of us. We have just had a little, but you speak more. Let it be elaborated and let us receive deeper understanding of your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And if you are in any relationship that is abusive and frustrating, may the Lord help you to break up in the name of Jesus Christ. If you have been in, a, in an organization that has tied you up and you don't even know how to come out of it because you, have, you are so much committed, maybe you have even joined a court. Maybe you are a preacher. Okay, I'm looking at, look at me. You are a preacher. But you are going to join cult because you want your church to grow. 
and you are afraid that if you come out, they will kill you. God can save you. You can come back, come out of that patriotic involvement and get yourself saved. If not, you will die and perish. I'm not threatening you. I'm telling you what you are inside. May God deliver you. You are looking for somebody to, to lay hand on you. That man that lay hand on you, do you know him? You want to connect. You want to, you want to, you want to tap. The place, you are, the place you are going to tap from. Don't look at the public show. Find out before you go and tap into, into, into poison. And the Lord deliver everyone who is hearing me this morning from whatever bondage or engagement that you are in that is not of God and that is not going to help your spirit, your soul, and your body in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Lift up your offering wherever you are as you give to the glory of God by your cheerfulness and by your willingness. You don't need to be compelled to give an offering. I don't need to force you if you don't believe God will destroy you. If you don't have the heart to support God's work, that is your own thing. But if you wish to do that, lift it up wherever you are and the Lord accepts your offering in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to give and to sow into the kingdom. Accept our offerings in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you for coming and for being part of World Congress. We meet again on Sunday for another teaching in World Congress. God bless you and bye-bye.